especially interested in the scientists and what you know what they were doing, the industrialists, the people that were really kind of moving the technological revolution that Russia was going through at the time. I mean, after the war, they really kind of went through it, uh, you know, similar to what we went through in terms of industrialization and <laughs> technology and all that. I think if you were to ask any premier of the Soviet Union, if there was a middle class, they would say, no, of course not. We're a communist society. We don't have a middle class. Um, but there definitely was a an elite class in terms of wealth that were benefiting <laughs> off of you know, skimming the top. Corruption was very high. Uh, and that was really mostly related to people who were in the Communist Party, for the most part. Um, I'm interested if anybody else actually has anything to say about this topic, because I this is one of the things that I don't know as much on is especially class structure in the Soviet Union. fiberglass bomb shelters that you're supposed to dig a hole in the ground and put it in and that sort of stuff. What was it like on the other side? It's very interesting that you asked this because um, I, I think that the answer is so specific for every single person, what it was like. Same as in America, it's very specific. Working in the beta house, people come in and share with me so frequently what they went through and it ranges from like, I lived in New York City and I was constantly worried about it to like, oh, I lived in Minnesota, I wasn't super worried about it. So it is a very individual experience, I, I think. Um, but I, I don't think that um, the bomb shelter craze, like it was in America, we can call it a craze, it didn't really hit the Soviet Union, partially because people you know, did not have a huge amount of expendable income. And um, you know, during the 1960s, uh, there was a housing project done by the Soviet state um, to build all these apartment complexes. And I mean, there were like five families living in one apartment that had like two bedrooms maybe. And I mean, they were very, very downtrodden. They're called uh, Khrushchevskis because they were Khrushchev, kind of like uh, Hoovervilles or whatever. Right. Um, but they were just these, I mean, they just love it. In terms of, of money, they just didn't have it to build all these bomb. I mean, there, there are definitely bomb shelters. I've been to a bomb shelter in Moscow. Um, but I think those are work for the higher ups. I don't think those were for everybody. Yes, sir? I, I mean, I've known Russians since 74. I worked with them, and these were all what we would call middle class. And in other words, they worked from some of the science cities. Uh, most of them were associated with the International Atomic Energy Agency. They had dodges, they had apartments, in Moscow or elsewhere, they were living at this point in like Vienna. Um, and we don't think of it, but there was what we would call a middle class. They had money to spend. They loved living in Vienna because they were paid far more than they would have been paid in Russia, but still, they had a good life there. Oh, de definitely. I'm not. I'm not ever going to be somebody who says that every single person in the Soviet Union just hated it and it was 100% suffering and 0% fun times. But I think your example is actually for the Soviet for Soviet society, that's actually pretty pretty upper class to have those experiences. I mean, even though it's American middle class, um, because things like having dodges was really reserved for people who were doing very well economically. Yeah, so. You know, now they also have the Trumps and the others who have billions of dollars. Mm. Right? I mean, yeah. there is their ten for one percent. Oh, absolutely! Now in Russia, it is a, a land of 
inequality in a way that is particularly heartbreaking because of the oligarchs in Russia. I, when I was in Moscow, I stayed in central Moscow where every single car parked on my block was a Mercedes G-Wagon, which I think is like a $300,000 car. Like the crappy cars were Range Rovers. Like those were the cars that people were like, oh my God, you drive that? Like it was just so wealthy. But then, you know, you get out 40 miles outside of Moscow, it's not like that anymore, you know? So that, which I mean, is not totally unheard of in America either, income inequality, but um, it's very severe in Russia. It's not the most severe in the world, but it's it's severe, in my opinion. Yes? So was there a, uh, a big change depending on where in the Soviet Union you were? Because it's an enormous country. Uh, and not only that, but you know, was, was city life significantly different? Um, so there was some... In, in ways that are different from the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, I think the most different from the U.S. would be like public transportation. That was a huge undertaking by the Soviet system because uh, the idea was that they would build this like beautiful perfect transportation system and it would like extol the virtues of communism um, and so the Soviet the Moscow metro, metro rather is like um, it's all marble and like a hundred foot ceilings and you know it's very ornate beautiful murals that go for like a hundred feet it's super beautiful um, other than that I mean just living in a communist society things are going to be different you know I mean yes there's going to be shops but a lot less than there would be in you know American society or British society especially at that time um, there was a huge urbanization uh, phenomenon during the Soviet Union um, because well it's because um, very early on in Soviet history like right when it starts going in like 1917 the very early 1920s um, the Weirdly enough, first enemies of the state of the Soviet Union were like the peasantry. <laughs> so there were these groups called kulaks, which were wealthy peasants, and they were persecuted against. Um, and so a lot of people decided to leave the countryside and come live in the city. And um, you know, technology and urbanization were uh, just kind of Soviet ideals anyway. That you would all be workers, and um, so it kind of all fit together in that way. And there was urbanization and um, did I answer your whole question, or I, I'm ki I kind of like living on the east end. Of oh Russia yes. Wasn't significantly different from living in the west end. Well, so in all the like in the entire Soviet Union, um, being Russian was definitely like the best. <laughs> like um, Soviet culture ends up kind of just being Russian culture. Uh, the rest of the SSRs were not considered as um, central to Soviet ideology and as important to the socialist movement as um, Russia was. And then obviously like in the big cities, there's gonna be a lot more available to you. I mean, even today in Russia, I think the average salary in Russia is like $125 a month or something. It's low, but that's because, I mean, in the cities it's, it's high, but in the countryside it's just so low. A lot of that countryside was totally forgotten about. There's actually a really great um, book written by my advisor's advisor, it's called Stalin's Peasants, and it's about all the peasants out in the countryside who just were like, I hate the Soviet Union, and just did wild stuff all the time. There was very little like law enforcement in a lot of these areas, especially during the Stalin period. So if you're interested in that topic, Stalin's Peasants, it's really actually interesting, and not just because I think this is interesting. <laughs> it's better than tempered steel. <laughs> did you have a question? Oh, you would have been good. I did. I love the fact that you brought up the sci-fi, mm -hmm. the love for sci-fi, because I'm wildly interested in, in the space program for them, because, you know, Sputnik's obviously a, a remarkable moment in history, and mm -hmm. how, how, how was that interpreted when it came into the culture, and how, because, it, I mean, there's got to be vast amounts of money that's dedicated to, we've got to beat the United States, and we have to do all these things, and we in turn do what we do in order to, to compensate, you know, like, can you speak more to the space program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my favorite thing about the space program is there's a lot of moon landing deniers uh, on the Soviet side. Oh. oh. And still to this day, you can like, if you know Russian and you start Googling it in Russian, people to this day really don't think we landed on the moon because every single milestone uh, when it comes to space travel was the Soviet Union beat us and then we beat them to the moon mm -hmm. and that's kind of like the, the whole enchilada you know yeah, <laughs> so yeah. um, that really upset them 
uh, space travel was just something in the Soviet Union too that uh, it represented, you know, freedom for them. And uh, even if you don't like your country or you're not the hugest fan of it at the moment, you still want it to be the best. You know, the same with my work in my thesis was on the Olympics, and that was kind of what I talked about in my work was even when you are not 100% on your country's side, you still want them to be the best at everything. And so that desire to beat the United States in space travel was what sort of sparked this sci-fi, but a lot of it was just, um, even starting in like the 1910s, um, people in Russia and then people in the Soviet Union were just really interested in sci-fi. It just it got really big there really quick, and um, I think it's just kind of that fantastical element that it really it spoke to something in the in the Russian soul that <laughs> just it, it really caught on. What's interesting is that the Western interpretation of a lot of that is like, oh, look, they're obsessed with utopia because it, it's so bad there. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of the Western interpretation of the time was that they were obsessed, uh, particularly the sci-fi book We by Yevgeny Zemyatin, which is actually a book George Orwell wrote and then wrote in 1984. Um, people wrote, read that and just thought like, oh, they're only writing this because they're so miserable when Really, the case was much more that they were just extremely proud of this thing that their country was doing that they were unequivocally the best at. Um, now, I'm sure if you asked a Kazakh or you asked a Uz, uh, Uzbek about their opinion of the space race, you're going to get a really different answer because they were totally <laughs> displaced for the space program. Um, but, uh, you know, for most of the Soviet Union, that was. Yes. So I'll, I'll switch that to Westerns. I mean, we had, you know, our seat of powers in the East Coast and everything went west with the frontier. Their seat of powers in Moscow went to the east. Was there any sort of Western, you know, John Wayne-ski genre that was that? <laughs> <laughs> that was actually really popular. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that was really popular. Popular almost the exact same time that the, the West was really popular in America, and that's just like what Siberia is supposed to represent. Like it's the West for us, but it's Siberia because um, the far eastern seaboard had already been occupied by people for you know hundreds of years at that point. But there's that whole stretch in the middle, and um, it's pretty much like our American Midwest. It's not a frozen tundra or anything, um, and so it was very agreeable. And people did move out there and you know form their own communities, and it um, was considered kind of lawless. The caucuses were also kind of huge for this. Like, um, oh, like, we're out here, frontiersmen, especially because the people of the caucuses, they didn't particularly like and considered them to be sort of lesser people, particularly the Chechens. So, like, there's the book A Hero of Our Time, which is about a really cool, noble dude who's, like, really awesome and valiant. He goes out and goes around and learns the stories of the different people also doing the same thing out in the caucuses. And then there's Prisoner of the Caucasus, which is about a guy who gets taken prisoner in the Caucasus. That, that was actually kind of a popular. And that actually was adapted in late Soviet media, um, which we, ha we didn't really, haven't really talked about. But like late 80s Soviet media, there was an adaptation, for instance, of Prisoner of the Caucasus. That kind of came back into fashion right at the end. Okay. Yes. You. Okay. In the striped shirt. Uh, Comment on both of those. Um, they were also making films, Western films, about the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of Uzbek actors, for instance, were recruited to play Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Really? Um, yeah, they so were. there's this whole genre of American Westerns made by Russian filmmakers. Interesting. Um, and then uh, Chinggisai Matov's The Day Lasts More Than 100 Years is a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful book um, about the space program in Kazakhstan. And it's written from the perspective of a Kyrgyz author, and it's actually quite critical of the Soviet. What's the title? The day lasts more than a hundred years. I, I'm, I'm interested in some of the critical nature. I mean, you brought up the Magnificent Seven and then kind of the lawlessness out there. And I've seen. I, I've got a copy of the film you. Have a Nice Bath, which is very critical of the, the housing industry, and it's a little bit Western, but some of the critical frontiersness film industry stuff really interests me. So thank you. In the striped shirt? Oh, sorry. Also, over there. Oh, okay. 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 I was just curious about uh, cultural like um, expression of you know love of uh, non-weapon uses of nuclear power, whether it be energy or radio medicine, et cetera, et cetera. It was a big thing in the United States uh, following the war and during the Cold War period. Um, did it have a similar fall in Russia? Like, what did they? One day, you know, I was randomly surfing the internet and stumbled upon. Uh, 
Russian reactor technology. They put reactors and everything. There were a series, I think it was on the Eastern Seaboard, of uh, nuclear-powered lighthouses that were designed so they could run for 20 years without anyone entering them and refueling them, et cetera, et cetera. And I was wondering if that percolated also over to popular culture as far as whether it might be science fiction or anything. It's, it's area completely outside of my knowledge. Is there anybody in this room that could answer this question better than me? Because <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, yes. The Soviet equivalent of uh, Plowshare was much bigger. Uh, Plowshare only had something like six small-scale tests. The Soviet equivalent had about 120 full-scale tests. And they put a reactor and everything from lighthouses to uh, seed sterilizing units to uh, portable reactors that were self-propelled. Um, exactly. And uh, uh, so the idea of an atomic powered future was huge. And the Soviet state encouraged this kind of mentality and encouraged through uh, museums and moving uh, educational uh, symposia, uh, things that the average Soviet citizen would go and see. And this is our future, the atom. And this is going to ameliorate all the problems that the, the workers had in the past by cheap uh, power through uh, exploring the cosmos through understanding uh, how to manipulate genes. Uh, it, so it became much bigger in the Soviet Union than uh, in practice and amongst the public than it ever was in the West. Yes. So I, my question is, you know, to what extent can we consider communism to be, you know, the state, sort of a state religion for the Soviet Union? And what kind of rituals involving like public participation would have ingrained that? Oh, um, so right, there's the famous quote by Karl Marx that religion is the opium of the masses, and that was definitely the uh, state-held opinion that it was dumb if you were religious. <laughs> uh, pretty pretty much as simple as that. Um, I have heard conflicting reports from people who actually lived in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, yeah, we could be religious, it just was going to impact your job and your standing mm -hmm. in society. And some people say, in my city you really could not be religious at all, you could not be openly religious. Um, and so I, I would say that, you know, depending on where you were and what time period it was, you know, that was pretty much the best you could hope for, is that you would just really never really succeed in your job and mm -hmm. in your personal life uh, if you were religious. Um, I don't know if you lived really far out in the countryside if it was the same because um, it was much less uh, patrolled or watched over um, by the state. And, but speaking just of urban centers, um, in terms of what they did to like make people feel like they were members of the Communist Party. I mean, first of all, everybody was a member of the Communist Party. Yeah. Everyone. Um, when you were a little kid, you would be in this thing called the Young Pioneers. And it was like the Boy Scouts, but it's like Communist Boy Scouts. Um, which I guess is, I've learned that I think in the Boy Scouts, you know, you do things like you learn how to run a business and stuff. So uh, it was sort of similar just from like a Soviet perspective of, um, you know, learning how to do these different things that were integral to society. And then you would also go out and shoot guns and camp and do stuff. It was for boys and for girls. It wasn't just for Boy Scouts, or boys, like the Boy Scouts. Um, and uh, then when you were a teenager, you would be in the Komsomol. And that really, like, got you ready to do whatever it was you were going to go do after you graduated from high school. And that really, like, sort of brought you into the adult communist world, like being in the Komsomol. Um, I mean, and obviously there are rallies, there's uh, saluting pictures, there's all that kind of classic uh, imagery when we think of Red Square or something, you know. Um, but yeah, it was, it was mostly just that like your whole job and therefore your whole livelihood revolved around your participation in the Communist Party. To be in good standing with the Communist Party meant that you would do well at your job. If you were rising up in the Communist Party, you were going to be doing better in your job. And obviously that then reflects on your personal life, your friends with people who are also, you know, for being upstanding members of communist society and so on and so forth. So it was a huge incentive to at least, you know, outwardly pretend that you you totally believed it hook, line, and sinker. Of course, in people's private lives, 
you know, with, with friends, they're much more likely to be like, some of this is stupid, right? <laughs> but, uh, or some of this is awful, right? But um, at least, like, your outward perception, that was... <laughs> In the orange shirt? So, your talk, um, you really covered how people in, in Russia secretly, you know, tried to embrace Western styles and culture. Did that change their views towards Americans uh, politically? Um, have any influence on that? Well, I think, again, it's one of those questions where it's a very personal thing for each person, but mm -hmm. I think the, the it, much more it changed their perception of the Soviet state than it did their perception of, of Westerners. I think it was much more that they, uh, I know that I was reading um, a particular article in preparation for this about the Beatles, and one kid you know, was talking about how once he started listening to Western music, he started really seeing the cracks in the Soviet state. And so I think it was much